All right, thanks ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, yeah, so my name is Chris Lowe. I'm the uh, CTO of SOAR. We're building a new digital atlas. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you today about is just very, very high level look at software architecture for building large scale mapping applications. Um, so one of the things that I'd like you to guys to get out of this is sort of an understanding of how certain technical and infrastructure decisions can affect the users and they can affect their overall business. So, slobs, um, it's a bit of a clickbaity title to the uh, presentation here from satellites to slobs. And what I'm trying to say here, I'm not taking a dig at our users, I'm not trying to you know, take a poke at them. What I'm trying to say here is that when it comes to accessing maps and satellite imagery, our users deserve the right to be lazy. They deserve the right to have really easy access to their content and uh, it should be seamless. And one of the things I find, um, uh, being, a, being, a, being a bit of a technical, technical guru, um, and is that a lot of times my own technical details and technical implementation sort of decisions bleed into user land and it starts to affect the users in detrimental ways. And um, I, you know, I've been here for a couple of days now, I've had a chance to have a chat with a lot of you guys and uh, it's really overwhelming just how knowledgeable in, you, know, you guys are with your, um, you know, with your geospatial uh, te technologies. So you guys are probably guilty with this at some point or another as well when you're having a discussion with someone who's a bit lay and, suddenly these uh, details about your, you know, the minutiae of your technical implementations and your technical details start bleeding into your users. So, yeah, so the main, the main, the main, the main point here I'm trying to make is that very often our technical details, our technical uh, information starts bleeding into user land in, 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 uh, in poor ways. Um, additionally, additionally uh, our entrepreneurs, our decision makers, government, you know, overriding bodies, these guys also deserve the right to be lazy. Um, the, the, they need access to the really salient bits of information about how this will affect, how decisions will affect their, their business and how it will affect the, uh, the, you know, the bottom line, the costing and so on. But, uh, you, but you can't sit in a meeting with, uh, you know, high level business people and uh, overwhelm them with uh, technical jargon and technical details. So, uh, there's, a, there's a term that we use in programming quite a lot called abstraction, and realistically what we're talking about here is, this is abstraction is the art of hiding details. So, as a, uh, it, it, one, thing to, one thing that's important is abstraction exists everywhere. You know, this microphone is working with certain, and, and the guys at the back here, we, we can kind of forget that they're doing what they're doing and just concentrate on what we're doing at the moment. Uh, but, so it exists everywhere and it exists a lot in programming. We use the term an awful lot in programming. So as a, as a software developer, my, my job sort of sits in the middle of this, this stack of uh, abstraction. I work with frameworks, I work with high level languages, I work with libraries. Um, I don't need to be concerned about how transistors work or how you know, the underlying CPU operates. I can just sort of forget about that. Um, it's kind of interesting to know how they work and, and, and uh, the certain details that are maybe salient at certain, at certain points, but for the most part I can forget that they exist. And similarly, this pyramid of abstraction really shows that I sort of have a responsibility as well to make sure that my detail doesn't bleed into higher levels. So, yeah, so keeping the, uh, keeping the details from leaking is a huge part of abstraction. Bit of a Dilbert comic for you. Um, it, this happens all the time. So abstraction bleeds, uh, we call it abstraction bleeds. So this is when your, your own details bleed into other areas of concern. And in this case, the stakeholder, the, the, the guy here is trying to solve as many problems as he possibly can from his user. And the engineer Dilbert is turning around to him and saying, you know, you realize this is gonna be far too complex to actually build or to, to, to use and manage. So uh, abstraction does bleed. And realistically, what the antidote here is really clear communication between the various levels and um, to make sure that there's uh, a, a, clear, a clear dialogue. Um, I, I'm talking to the wrong crowd to give you a GDAL 101, but GDAL, uh, the, the, uh, so obviously I won't go into GDAL too deeply at all, but um, the one thing that's very interesting here in terms of the topic of this presentation is the acronym for GDAL, the Geospatial Data Abstraction Library. So, yeah, uh, from the previous slide, you obviously saw this is, uh, GDAL is uh, an abstractor library, so what we, internally what happens with GDAL is when you load your raster or your vector data in, 
um, at, at a programming level, it treats it as, as if it's all sort of the same thing and it hides that actual implementation detail about the individual, you know, ones and zeros that actually make up that data format and it allows you to work more abstractly with that data set. Um, so you probably, uh, uh, you, yeah, and you probably use tools like GDAL Info, GDAL Warp, you know, there's a whole bunch of tools that come along with GDAL, and this is another layer of abstraction. This is almost like an application level of abstraction over the top of GDAL, uh, because it allows you to sort of use it without needing to poke around on the internals of the actual, the actual code. But they, but they, but they, they still, um, un, behind the scenes, they still use, uh, you know, the GDAL library to, 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 to do their operations. So one of, the, um, one of the most common sort of use cases for building some sort of web mapping application stack is literally just delivering a map to a client. You know, how does, that, how, does, how does a user open that up on their web browser or on their mobile phone? And one of the most common ways that we do this is by tiling the raster data. So this is a quad tree, and the way the quad tree works is every, um, uh, the, the map is split up into grids. Each grid is usually a 256 by 256 pixel uh, tile and each tile, once you zoom into the next zoom level, that's split into four tiles. So the important thing here from a uh, sort of a, an architectural point of view for if, if you're building a, a service that, that, that allows you to deliver your maps online is that the, the processing time. So every step down in the zoom level that you go, you get deeper and deeper processing, uh, a longer processing time. It, 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 I say it, it four times is a good, is a good sort of, uh, uh, approximation, but you know, this, this can vary a little bit depending on the data set. Um, so yeah, for very small maps and very uh, uh, very high zoom levels, you know, if you're not going in too deep, uh, you might get away with you know, very fast processing just on your, your laptop or your, or your desktop computer. Um, but the moment that you start getting too deep, it eventually reaches this sort of threshold where going a single zoom level can suddenly take you days, months, days, weeks, maybe even, I've seen months for, for processing very high resolution maps. Um, so, where this where this bleeds into user land though is what happens when the data it requ the data requirements is is immediate. So, two of the two of the uh, quite sad jobs that we have had a very our organisation has had a very very small part in was the uh, search for MH370. My CEO was very involved in the uh, uh, looking at the uh, satellite imagery of the potential disaster area, the potential crash zone, to try to find the data. And another one more recently, which was extremely sad, was the uh, Gulf Livestock One ship. Um, this was a, a livestock ship that left the port of New Zealand um, and sank off the coast of Japan uh, back in 2020. So in the case of these guys, you know, the, the, our users here, my slobs, are um, search and rescue. These, these are people who, you know, and, and, and the, the people that are potentially sitting in life craft waiting to be rescued. Um, so if I was to turn around to them as a technical director and say, oh yeah, your map's gonna be ready in eight days, that's, 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 not, that's no, no GG, that's not gonna work. Um, so yeah, so uh, what, we, what, what I'm gonna segue into now is how do I sort of, uh, what, are com what are some of the backend infrastructures that we can look at to um, uh, either improve delivery time or to allow for much greater concurrency to allow multiple maps to be processed at the same time. And as I promised at the beginning, this is an abstract. This is, um, I'm treating you guys as slobs now. You know, you, you deserve to be lazy, so there's gonna be no big uh, architectural, you know, overview diagrams or too much jargon. It's very, very high level. So a couple of the, uh, a couple of the pieces of infrastructure that you'll see all the time is um, a Docker. So Docker is a fantastic tool. It allows you to containerize your application. It allows you to take your entire application um, your, all of your dependencies, like in this case GDAL or GDAL2 tiles, if, that's, if, you, if you're doing a simple tiling process, but it allows you to place it into a Docker container um, and, and allows you to deploy that into various cloud providers. Uh, it's extremely, uh, and again, it's an abstract library, so it allows you to sort of abstract away the operating system and the, and the, the development environment, and the application stack allows you to deploy that into the cloud. Uh, as you move down the list, this list here on the left here towards Kubernetes and serverless, you start getting into more complex develop, dev, dev operations. So you need more trained developers to be able to manage and to, to, to set these things up. Um, so you know you can, you, be, you can be looking at slightly larger complexity in terms of um, time to market, but, uh, but you also get a lot more power and flexibility out of them. So with Kubernetes, uh, the way I describe Kubernetes to a lay person is it allows for horizontal scaling. So it allows you to treat multiple computers together concurrently, uh, side by side, as if it was one giant supercomputer. 
So 20 years ago, if you needed a lot of processing power, your only option really was to make, build a larger computer, build a supercomputer. But these days with Kubernetes, you can use lots and lots of small instances on the cloud and treat them as a really colossal supercomputer. Um, and I've seen CPU, you know, I've seen Kubernetes clusters running up to many thousands of CPU cores. Um, uh, so uh, very, very powerful. Um, and more recently, I believe we actually have, I'm not sure if he's in the, uh, yeah, so we've got, we've, got, we've, got, we've got a gentleman here from AWS who was talking about serverless earlier today. And um, well, I'm, I'm a huge fan of serverless. This really changed the game when this came out. Um, serverless effectively allows you to treat um, like a, a, work, a, a CPU instance, like a work instance, a piece of, um, a piece of code that needs to execute uh, on demand. So it allows you to scale on demand and allows you to access the, uh, the, that compute power as, a, as, as it is required. And we can, we'll, I'll, I'll show you some of the implications of that in a, a future slide. So we talk about, um, this, this, this now becomes my abstraction between myself as a developer and the business operators because eventually somebody needs to pay for this large scale mapping application. There's gonna be ongoing server costs and so on. So the, 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 and the one thing that the business owners are gonna wanna know is how much is this gonna cost me per month? How much is this, how, how is it gonna, uh, how, how is it going to change over time as my user base grows? So you're looking at just at a very, a very, um, uh, not, not a, not a, correct view of what user interaction over time might look like, but it's again, it's, it's abstract. Um, one thing I notice a lot with mapping applications is you get very spiky behavior from your network traffic. Um, maps, if you have, might happen to have a couple of people sitting online at the same time or zooming into the same area, you're gonna get a big spike in your network traffic very quickly um, and that'll, that'll drop off. And, but, but, this, but this graph shows what a typical sort of a, a successful mapping application might look like. It trends upwards over time and it's uh, spi uh, spiking up and downwards. Um, if you're running something like Docker and just uh, deploying Docker on a simple cloud compute instance, you're gonna get what I would refer to as the most ideal cost system. Um, you're gonna get a very flat cost. Um, the, you know, you're gonna know exactly how much your server's gonna, uh, server it's gonna cost to run your servers month in, month out, and it's gonna remain relatively steady. And like I said, another advantage of just running a very simple Docker container is you've got a very simple deployment system. Um, a developer should be able to knock out a Docker instance in a, in a couple of days, a day or two, and, um, and get that deployed and running. So it very, very simple to run. Um, there is a downside here though, and this is represented by everything that is above that graph, everything that is above that line. Um, wh what we're looking at here is situations where your users are attempting to uh, get more out of your servers than they're able, it, it, it's a throughput problem. You're attempting to get more um, processing out of your, uh, your Docker instance than, than it's able to provide. So above this graph, what you're looking at is lost users, users that are gonna try to log in and look at the map and it's just not gonna load. Um, in, uh, another thing I'll point out as well is quite often when you see this when you are above capacity for your, for your servers, you're not just looking at a flat drop off of users, like we're not just getting half of the users are able to use it and half aren't. What you, you'll find a degradation occurs. It'll, it'll, it'll start, fail, it'll start get becoming extremely slow and it'll pretty much time out for everything. You tend to get clogged up. So uh, again, this is, this is a technical decision that, that affects uh, the business operators because you need to be aware of uh, what will happen if you do, if you do grow. Kubernetes, um, as I mentioned before, allows for scaling. If you've got really good developers and really good DevOps, you're able to do things like auto scaling. So you can listen to when your cluster is starting to reach its capacity and automatically scale that up. And once it's out of, uh, and, and once it's, uh, you know, if you have a drop off, you can dial your cluster back down uh, and for, save on, for save on costs. There is, again, with um, a very high uh, uh, priority mapping situations, Auto scaling can sometimes be a little bit too slow for what you need. Um, it usually takes a couple of minutes from when the, it detects the fact that there is a, uh, a, a, an increase in traffic to, 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 to scaling up and delivering that extra compute power. But, uh, but yeah, Kubernetes can, is definitely extremely powerful. In, in the past, the way that we've run this is uh, Kubernetes clusters is by always just being a little bit above capacity, accepting the fact that it's gonna be a bit more expensive for our needs, but to try to always mitigate the fact that we might get a sudden spike in traffic and uh, and uh, uh, having the, the CPU capacity to be able to, be able to support that. Um, 
Yeah, so serverless, uh, as, as, as I mentioned before, is more of a you, uh, pay for what you use kind of infrastructure. Um, and this, uh, I, I, again, like I said, a really huge fan of serverless, serverless infrastructure. Um, you kind of get a, a, the best of it. The best of both worlds. Like, like a, um, the, the downside here, though, is that we are looking at much more um, advanced DevOps. You know, you, it's a brand new technology. There are certain um, there are there, there are certain things that we found when we migrated over to serverless uh, that have tripped us up and that requires you know, you know some 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 extra work around to, to make sure that it's performing the way that we want to. But by and large, the the really nice thing about this graph, of course, is that. Um, when I'm asked how much is it going to cost, I can turn around and say, well, that depends on how many people are using our service. The more, if we're really successful in our in our business, then you know we're going to have a, a much larger running cost. But but um, uh, but but yeah, it's reflected by the uh, by the amount of people that are using our service. So this first line is probably going to be very controversial to a lot of people in the audience um, when I say that ser that storage is generally very cheap. Um, I know I've spoken to a few people that are running many, many petabytes worth of data, and that's obviously a very large operational cost. But by and large, the, the reason I say that server is cheap is that you can be reasonably confident month in, month out, how much you're going to be paying for your servers, uh, for your storage. Something on S3, you know, you're looking at, yeah, just, you know, cents, on, cents and dollars on the on the terabyte. So you know, you, you can be you can be you, uh, on the gigabyte. Sorry, so you can uh, be fairly confident in fa in how much data you're going to be storing ahead of time. And, um, and you can project that into your cost structure. Uh, processing can be expensive depending on what you're doing, um, but by and large, again, it's fairly easy to predict. The, um, the, the, that, that graph that I showed you with the network, um, the network uh, usage, the user interactions over time, that's the really volatile one in, in my opinion, and it's the one that you really need to pay the most amount of attention to. Um, it's definitely, for me, the largest single cost contributor to our backend infrastructure. And um, like I said, also the most volatile. The, 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 the worst case scenario for me would be to wake up one morning and look at my logs and find that I've had a massive influx of users overnight. And then I need to, you know, need to go to my boss and explain that we're going to have a bit of a cost blowout the next day on our next, on our next bill. So the, there's a couple of things you can do to sort of mitigate that. Um, and the, and the, pretty much the best thing you can do is, um, uh, the most successful thing I've found is to put up really good analytics and monitoring systems. So we have like automated Slack messages that get triggered under certain thresholds of, of user, user activity. Um, a lot of analytics for when things sort of fall over. Um, but, but, but using analytics to sort of generate these sort of trends and to sort of look at these generalities and how, how costs might change over time is extremely important, I think. Um, and Cloudflare caching, yeah, if you're not using Cloudflare caching for your web mapping application, you should definitely be looking at it because it's a huge cost saver. It allows, um, it allows for a much more efficient uh, usage of your network. Um, I am running out of time, well, very briefly on the front end technology stacks, Leaflet being your general kind of use case for web mapping. Um, great on mobile, great on desktop, very flexible. D3, JS, not usually associated with, um, with mapping technologies, but it is a generalized visualization tool. And I've used this sort of quite a few times for things like if I need a quick, quick chloroplast map or a quick data visualization, extremely useful tool and very familiar to front-end developers. Uh, CZM is extremely fun to look at, 3D mapping. Um, and uh, Whirly Globe is one I want to give a bit of a shout out to as well. This is sort of a, a, a guy who's building a mapping engine on his own. Um, uh, but extremely flexible. So if you are looking at a mapping engine, have a look, have a quick look at Whirly, uh, have a quick look at Whirly Globe, because he's um, doing some pretty, pretty, pretty fun stuff. And um, yeah, a quick, quick summary, which I, which I won't go through. But um, but yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, any questions for Chris? Over here, Nick. Actually, no, don't, don't let me go. <laughs> um, so you had those charts showing the cost of, I guess, like single container deployment with no scaling, Kubernetes EKS with scaling, and then the serverless approach. Um, but what's the actual relative change in cost between those three approaches for your use case? In my own use case, we found that Kubernetes was about five times more expensive than serverless. Like, it literally, it literally cut my bill by a fifth. Uh, when, when, we, when we made the migration, so it was a, it was a big it was a big change. Kind of related question: Is there a scale at which going back to containers is going to make sense? 
Um, not, not for the kind of application that we're developing where it's a, a web mapping application where it has to always be available, but if you are more sort of data processing, um, one of the real advantages of Kubernetes is you can use like spot instances to really save on, on, on your costs. So instead of needing, if you don't need your processing immediately, if, you, if you're happy waiting for uh, spare instances to run, it's, 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 very, it's worth going to Kubernetes. So yeah, different, different tools for different reasons. Now, if you just keep going for a couple more questions, I just want to let you know that the other talk in the other room is starting about an hour if you want to go up there. So I do want to give Chris the opportunity to have a couple more questions. Just to echo out the, the sort of compromise between performance and the need for uh, an understanding of the architecture and you know hiring developers who un understand how to use these tools. Uh, I guess my own personal experience has been a nice compromise in that space is using uh, cloud managed services like AWS Lambda or Azure Functions to do a lot of this um, horizontal scaling stuff. Have you had any experience with that? Do you have any comments on, on that side of things? Yeah, Lambda, Lambda. We, we, use, we used to use Lambda for our sort of just our general API endpoints, you know, things like user logins and fetching data and so on. Um, serverless is effectively, it's, it's almost an equivalent to Lambda, but for a Docker container. So instead of needing, instead of like a uh, Lambda function being um, you know, here is a function that I need to run, and it, you know, lambdas will have access to you know basic networking calls and so on. Your your serverless will have access to a full Docker container and all of the extra dependencies that you want. So like we 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 stick it with GDAL in its entirety and our entire tiling engine into a serverless container and 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 deploy it like that. So so it's sort of Lambda used GDAL through a container in in Lambda, but yeah, um, yeah maybe we can discuss it. Yeah, I'd love to. Any other questions? Um, yep. Nick over here. Um, just a quick question on, on serverless. Did you n notice a change in latency? Because if you, it's like it's such an on-demand kind of service where people are requesting tiles, like, was there a big difference in latency? No, one of, uh, pretty much equivalent, but one of the caveats that we did find was uh, things like cold starts. So if um, the the if it hasn't been used inside of the cloud infrastructure for a while, it might take a little bit of time for that thing to spool up. So that again, that was what, what I was saying that um, it takes a little bit more DevOps and a little bit more sort of uh, expertise in these systems. That that was one of the things that we found was to was was cold starts. Um, but yeah, in terms of actual throughput, once 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 it was up and running correctly, we we it felt pretty much identical. I think we better end there, but thank you very much, Chris. I've got it. Thank you.